Hey guys, welcome to the Four Poster Bed and um, Christmas Eve. Yes, it's practically upon us. I haven't got to do anything today other than cavort around with my cello playing a Christmas carol. That's going to take me all day, believe it or not, because I'm filming it. Um, so yeah, I thought, well, why not start with a Christmassy one? Start Launch my TV show for expressive fitness properly with some... Uh, cello music and um, a bit of cavorting around with a scarf. I thought it would be good fun. And a cello, of course. Um, so what's been happening? Well, over here, this side of the water, Angleterre, um, we have actually quite boring headlines today, but James Cleverley, who's our Home Secretary, has made a joke about um, date raping his wife. <laughs> I mean, it's so inappropriate, but I can't... It's uh, somehow amusing because it's... You know, of course it was done ironically. I, and don't forget, I don't like the Tories. I hate them. Come on, Romeo. Come on, then. There we go. Yes, I don't like the Tories at all. But it was done in a private conversation and in an ironic way. Apparently, he said it, he had to... I think it was something along the lines of he had to drug her with rehypnol because to keep her interested, but it was only a little bit, so it didn't count as being illegal. It was along those lines, <laughs> which I do think is rather amusing. Um, I was in the dentist the other day, and um, I was just having a conversation, because I always go with Mum together. Yes, darling, yes, darling, you want to join in the convo? And um, we were joking about me be being a hypnotherapist, and I... Hip, I did a joke hypnotising thing, you know, with my mum. And I said, you will leave me all your money when you die. Now, my mum hasn't got any money, and that's why it's funny. But the people at the dentist wouldn't have known that. <laughs> I just thought, that's really inappropriate, isn't it? And I thought, what, what possessed me to say that? Well, of, of course it was because she doesn't have any money. And she's quite elderly, so it was a bit of an age-appropriate joke or inappropriate because, you know, depending on which way you look at it, perhaps it was insulting or whatever. But, you know, I just thought, after this news today with James Coverley, I thought, no, that's just the sort of thing I'd say. Um, and if you think about it, if, I'd say, if, if I was talking about, you know, a friend and they weren't in the room and I said, oh, well, he clearly only got her because he drugged her with rehypnol, would that be funny as well? And I just thought, yes, it would be hilarious. <laughs> but I probably wouldn't be hounded by the press, even if I was famous and I said, would I? I don't know. Would I? Um, I mean, we all make... The, the, the thing about jokes, the wonderful thing about jokes is they're usually inappropriate. And, you know, I mean, I'm not particularly anti-woke, I, do, I don't think. Um... But, you know, it is a bit woke to be saying you can't make a joke about anything inappropriate because it's the inappropriate stuff that's, that puts us in hysterics. So um, I'm amused by it. Um, and the fact that the British press spends so much time on it, I mean, that's a whole other ball game, isn't it? Um, so what else? Well, a day of sort of nothingness. My Twitter's going very well, guys. It's going quite well. I've got followers and stuff, and I dream. I dreamt about Twitter. I did. I dreamt about robots and Twitter. So it's obviously been taking up a lot of my time, and it has taken up a lot of my time in the last week. And it's going to have to cool down a bit because it's you know I spend more time now marketing than I do making the old um, product. You know the video, the the classes and what have you. So that that's not not a great thing. But for me, there are two episodes of sharing per day so there's one that happens in a minute um sharing you know a couple of blog posts and some poetry and articles i wrote a couple of articles yesterday q and a's about my new business the expressive fitness which is rolling off my tongue now i don't have to think about what it's called what it is do you know what i mean so um and photos of marta marta hari and um i, d I don't think i found one of isadora duncan i found one of dita von Tees. um not not daring to compare myself to Dieter von Tees, you understand. 
but I, I realised as I was doing this scarf stuff yesterday that, you know, I was some of it was a bit burlesque and I thought, well, I could actually, you know, get some feathers and do some burlesque things. I thought that'd be quite good. So, um, I mean, any excuse to buy uh, feathers, really. <laughs> I need a boa because a boa and some fitness dancing would be great. High heels and a boa and some other clothes, <laughs> not naked. Um, so that's what I'm going to be doing in a minute. I'm going to go and look on AliExpress, which is my go-to, um, to see if I can find anything that they've made that is vaguely good, which I probably can't. But what I do discover on AliExpress is that you can get some quite good ideas. You put together, you know... I mean, you have to go quite deep into AliExpress. The thing is, m most stuff does come from China, even the good stuff. You've just got to find it. Um, so, you know, really look deeper, go deeper when you're doing your searches. And if I don't find anything there, I'll I'll try coming to the UK. But the thing is, our prices have rocketed and, and our, um, our charity shops have rocketed. And you can't any longer go on eBay and buy cheap vintage something. You can't. You They're all expensive. And it's disappointing but I'll tell you what it is doing. It's making me think that I should start making stuff rather than... Or converting stuff, you know? Um, so, yeah, I was looking at cat suits that I could paint. Um, I've got a uh, pair of overalls. This isn't for dance. Because overalls are never attractive, are they? They're never sexy. Um, even when Dexy's Midnight Runners wore them, they weren't sexy dungarees you know all that sort of thing so I've got these overalls these denim overalls that I wear they're a size 16 I'm a, I'm a size 10 well uh, is that a size 6 um USA um I'm I'm pretty petite at the moment because of my training but uh yeah they're, so they're quite big but then I was thinking last night oh, do you know what they need they need some bleaching like Skinner trousers do you know how to do that I'll tell you quickly you literally just get some bleach in a, a, well, you can just use a spoon and in, have it in a cup and just throw it all over them. Throw it all over the denim. Or you can use, if you want something a bit more splodgy and a little bit more even, I don't like that. It's too even. I like the skinnedy, really blotchy look. Um, but you can use a squeezy bottle, you know, like a washing up liquid bottle. And you don't have to use it full strength either. Um, and then you just do your squirrely designs all over the back and the front. Do it on something waterproof or, or something to protect, you know, the carpet underneath or whatever it is you're using. Um, do both sides. You can always put something between the, fr the front and the back. Do you see what I mean? So that it doesn't go all the way through. But it, it might look quite good if it goes all the way through. Um, and then after about... 20 minutes when it's done its thing I mean you could leave it on longer um, you stick it in the washing machine and give it a rinse and there you've got your bleached um, dungarees or your bleached jeans easy peasy we used to do it in London when I lived in London back in the uh, back in the old days in what 1980 when I was in London homeless, homeless and living with skinheads yep that was me so anyway, um, good times, good times. They weren't, they were terrible. And as soon as it got cold, I went back to my parents. I stayed nine months. So probably from, I don't know, January to September. Is that nine months? Yeah, about, isn't it? Oh, I don't know, it's eight months, isn't it? Um, and then it got cold and I just thought, no, no, this is not the life for me. The streets of, of um, Soho, Piccadilly Square, um, Leicester Square, I should say. Is there a Piccadilly Square? I don't know if there is. Anyway, we used to call it the Dilly, going up the Dilly. The Rent Boys referred to it as the Dilly. Um, I think they did a lot of their work there. And I knew a lot of the Rent Boys because I was homeless, you know, and a lot of the Rent Boys were homeless. But there were, um, you know, 13, 14-year-old runaways and they were on the game young boys I mean tragic really but that's how they got their money beautiful young boys the prettiest 
loveliest looking young gay boys you'd ever seen and they would they had they'd come and tell us about their clients that they you know they all they've got to do is like hit them a few times because they were dressed as skinheads well they were skinheads you know and that that was the punter's fantasy it's crazy isn't it 14 year olds absolutely crazy um i mean it still goes on I, i'm i'm sure but we frown we frown on it now i didn't think anything of um you know runaways being 14 I had a very good friend, a female, who'd run away because she was being abused. And I, I don't think it was sexually. I think it was more violence. But, uh, yeah, she, we didn't think anything of it. And every time the police came, because the police were always coming up to us and asking us for details, and they'd do a... What they could see, it's called a CRO. It's a criminal record observation, I think. And... Um, She'd just say she was 21 and give a false name because nothing was computerised then. So we're talking about 50-odd years ago. Nothing was computerised. Amazing, isn't it, to think that? How did the police do their job? Um, so it was only if they got arrested, you know, if the kids got arrested and then, you know, be fingerprints and stuff like that that could maybe tie them in with a missing child. And then they'd get carted off, go back home, and then they'd just be back the next day because they just, you know, leave again. So, yeah, lots of errant children in those days. I was about 19, I was a bit older. But I, I was quite young emotionally because I'd been to private school. So I was very naive. So in a way, these 13, 14, 15-year-old kids on the street were much wiser than I was. And I was just getting away from my abusive father. And then latterly, because I got married when I was 18, an abusive husband. Um, look, but people run away for good reason, you know. And our homeless population, I see there's a choir today, they're doing a Christmas choir, and the homeless people go every week. People Homeless and affected by homelessness. And um, it's really nice, actually, to see. The, obviously, as I'm a musician, so... You know, anything musical is enriching just to know about, just to, just you know, not, you don't even have to hear them. You just have to know the um, the pleasure that that'll bring all the people. And singing is great for that. You don't have to be very good at it to join in. They'll just put you at the back <laughs> and tell you to quieten down a bit. No one will hear you. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, guys, well, that's it for now. Um, I'll probably be back later with some more um, some more waffle. Have a great Christmas Eve if I don't manage to do another podcast. I'm going to try and do one tomorrow. We'll talk to my, uh, my family, talk to mum. I'll ask her about, I don't know, what could I possibly ask them? They're both quite old. They're sort of 80-ish. I could ask them what their best Christmas was, couldn't I? I might do that. So join me tomorrow for that. Um, and later on today, if anything exciting happens or I feel, you know, that I need to moan about something. Au revoir. <laughs>